First of all, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I want to talk to you today about something that has been on my mind for a few weeks now. And that was an experience that I had many years ago in the church. And I know other believers are dealing with this because it is not unique. And it is something I want to warn believers about. And that is witchcraft in the church. Now, that may sound a little unusual to you. I hope it does. I hope that's not your experience. That being said, I do know there are plenty of churches that sadly engage in these mechanisms of witchcraft. We know Paul admonished believers to bring in their witchcraft books and burn them. Well, ask yourself, what were believers doing with witchcraft books? Some of them may have had them from when they were practicing stuff and then they got saved and they just never got rid of it. That's one part. But the other is, there were those people who were engaging in those practices. Like Christians who have... They read the horoscope. They have playing cards. um, Video games that are satanic. Music that is absolutely demonic. And, you know, can't let go of it. The fact that you can't let go of it says there's a problem. Think about it for a second. Because you go, oh, it doesn't mean anything. If it doesn't mean anything... Why can't you stop? If it doesn't mean anything, why can't you throw it away? I can't answer that for you. You have to answer that for yourself. We are inundated, bombarded, saturated in the beast system. We're immersed in it. It's not any different for us than it was for Lot being in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says he vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Conversation means lifestyle there. But what they were doing. Every commercial now is pushing demonic lifestyles. Things that are not of God. Things that have demonic and satanic spiritual influence. We love the person, but we also have to be honest. They're not really lifestyles. That's a misnomer. They're death styles. Because no life can be generated with two people of the same sex being together. We can't play games. We can't pretend. These are not lifestyles. There is no life in them. They are an accursed thing. Whether people realize it or not. If you are a believer, I don't say that to condemn you. I say that to admonish you towards the truth. Remember what Jesus said. That people would not, men would not come to him because their deeds would be reproved. They don't come to him because their deeds are evil. And he is the light. And when you come to him, your darkness is exposed for exactly what it is. I'm supposed to be talking to believers now, so 
we shouldn't be fighting about this stuff. If you are wrestling with something, that's fine. I understand. Keep wrestling. That's the spirit warring against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And the Holy Spirit and your regenerated spirit, if you are indeed born again, will prevail. The devil's goal is to keep you ineffectual, in darkness, in whatever area of your life he can cause that to happen in through your affinity for things or your lust or your affections for things that are not like God, that are not godly, that are not holy, that are not decent, that are not in order. And he uses that as a weapon against you and a weapon against the body of Christ because if you're tied up in something, then it's almost guaranteed that you're not operating in the gifts that God gave you. You're not operating in the fruit of the Spirit. And you're not operating in spiritual warfare against the enemy. And that may be in varying degrees. I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that for you. Only you can recognize where you're being hindered. And in some cases, you may not even see it. You may have to get before the Lord so he can show you. Sin, which is self-inflicted nonsense, is a weapon that the devil will form against you when you engage in it. And sometimes it's stuff that you did many years ago that will come back and come after you later in life. Because he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy. But the blood of Jesus is against that serpent. He's a liar. And the truth ain't any. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Remember that, beloved. The devil can put up a strong case of accusation. But I have witnessed and I have seen things that look like they were impossible for people to overcome. And the Lord prevailed and confounded the devil. Don't look at your circumstances. Look to Jesus. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, that being said, see, the first thing you have to deal with is giving Satan no place. So if you've given him place, you need to recognize what place you have given him and close those doors. Close those portals. Because the devil will use them against you. If you're listening to, for example, if you're listening to music that is highly sensual, of a sexual nature. Is it any wonder before the end of the day that you are involved in something you ain't got no business? Or at the end of the week when you've been listening to it all week long? Or at the end of the month when you've been listening to it all month long? You set yourself up for that. You gave the devil place. Don't do it. It is difficult to separate the things that we like, that we have no business liking, that the flesh wants to do. But it's not impossible. And you can do it. This is where discipline comes in. Now, this is for people who want to move on in Christ. Don't just want to stay at, a, at, at, the, at the door, at the entrance. They want to go on. They want to go deeper. Only you can answer how far you want to go. But the Bible admonishes us to press on to the mark of the high calling of Christ. You've been called for a high calling, beloved. Not a cursory, not a low, not an introductory, but the high calling of Christ. 
another area um, is not just sensual music. There are music genres, and I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular, because if I do, people will just dismiss it. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit convict you. That if you study a little bit the history of where they came from, you'll see they never came from Christ. They never originated from Christ. So when you look at it, it's something that did not originate with him. Think about this. If it didn't originate with him, he's not the creator of it, then how is it going to be a blessed thing? Because if it didn't come from him, it came from the enemy. Or it came from corruptible, fallible men inspired by the enemy. So how are you going to take that thing that is a curse and ever try to make it blessed? It don't work that way. God will not honor that. And some of y'all wonder why you're having great difficulty in your life. A lot of it is the music you're listening to. Now, I want you to know that I can speak on this because I had great difficulty with it back in the day. I don't like giving too much detail about myself. I just don't. But this I will share with you. I was a avid music freak, lover, back in the day. I could name every artist, every song. If I had been on Name That Tune, they would have been in trouble. I had a great affection and affinity for it. Wanted to get involved in music did for a number of years in my church, but, you know, I wanted to get out there in that world and do some things. Yeah, a lot of church people do. Because they believe the devil's lie that somehow you're going to be different if you get out there and get involved in that beast system, and it is totally sold out for the devil. And don't nobody want to hear about Jesus just going to listen to booty-shaking music. So, you know, the two don't go together. They don't go together. And every time I tried to get involved in it, the Lord would block me, and I mean block. <laughs> and when God closed the door, can't no man open it. I don't care who they are. So he blocked me, and I ended up doing other things with my life. But I pursued that for a number of years and was very frustrated as a result. But I still have recollections of certain instances where I saw that that industry was not what it pretended to be. This is much more clear and blatant now than, than even then. But there still was a ton of stuff. We weren't looking with spiritual eyes. We didn't understand. There's only two kinds of people in this world, Joe. If if you are human, all right, there's only two kinds of people. Saved and unsaved. That's it. Just like a person can't be a little bit pregnant, you can't be a little bit saved. You can't be a little bit true Christian. You either are or you aren't. Now, there are those who will try to say that in order for a person to be a true believer, we're supposed to measure them by their works. No, I don't go by that because there's too many people in the fake it till they make it camp. Now, not that. The measure of a true believer is their profession of faith. It's what, when you ask them, who is Jesus to them? Or what has he done for them? And they can answer you correctly according to the scripture. That lets me know whether or not they're a believer. If I were to get out a yardstick and measure them according to their sin, the Bible already gives us that example. If God were to do that, it says, if he were to measure us or judge us according to our iniquity, who could stand? No one but King Jesus. 
Because he don't have none. Ain't no dirt on him. He swallowed up sin. And ain't no dirt on him. So, we can't use that as a guideline on how to judge whether or not someone's a believer. I never forget, it was a uh, co-worker of mine at the time. I met him and this other gentleman, and we, after, you know, discovering, talking, you perceive based on someone's spirit and what they're saying, whether or not they're a believer. And we all confirmed that we were believers, and so we were rejoicing over that, praising the Lord Jesus about it. And it was actually, they were they were people I was meeting at an orientation. I had We had all just been hired. And so this one brother and I really kind of hit it off, and we were we were talking, and we would go to lunch a couple of times during this week long orientation we had to attend. And about the second or third day, I don't remember exactly, of the orientation, the other gentleman. Well, let me back up a little bit. The gentleman I kind of hit it off with was a very, uh, how would I say, reserved kind of policy individual, um, very careful with his words kind of thing. You know, he's somebody you would call him just a righteous brother in the Lord, right? The other gentleman, he was a believer, a brother in Christ, but he was a little more rough around the edges. He came from a biker lifestyle, and he wore the leather, the vest, and, the, you know, some of the biker attire, and he rode a motorcycle. And he was a little more coarse in his conversation. And so the, pro, the the more polished gentleman, the more reserved gentleman, he had went into the restroom with this other gentleman, and they had been talking while they were in there. And uh, the other guy who was the biker and a little more, you know, rough around the edges, used some profanity and cursed and stuff about something that had upset him. And so that day when the more reserved gentleman and I went to have lunch on our lunch break, he got to talking about this incident that has happened in the restaurant where this man had used a lot of profanity and just kind of got outside himself. And he said, well, I don't think he's saved. This is what he said to me. And I said, well, brother, now I'm going to pause you on that. I want you to hear me on something. This is something I was just studying on in a couple of weeks prior. And it was the passage of scripture where Peter has kind of been hanging around these Judaizers and he'd been getting into his flesh. <laughs> and he had he had started to develop the attitude that some believers were not clean. Some believers were not what they were supposed to be based on them being a little rough around the edges. And the Lord Jesus appeared to him and stretched out a sheet, the Bible says, with all these creeping things on it. Like, I can imagine shellfish, <laughs> shrimp, some crab, maybe a couple of swine on there. <laughs> and, uh, and the Lord Jesus tells him, commands him, he says, take it, kill it, and eat it. And Peter says, not so, Lord, for no unclean thing has ever went past my lips. I'm paraphrasing here. And Jesus said, what I have made clean, don't you dare call unholy. Holy is sanctified, set apart, right? So he tells him this not once, not twice, but three times. And he rolls the sheet back up. And it, and it disappears into the heavens. And so uh, Peter understood what the Lord meant. He wasn't even talking about that food necessarily. It, it, that's an example of it because people will tell you certain things you shouldn't be eating. It's unclean. And, and he said, if I made it, it's good. And he's saying the same thing. What? The Bible tells us that Jesus is the one who began the work in us. 
And he's the one that's going to finish the work. So I told his brother that. And I showed him that passage of scripture. I said, so be careful now not to judge this man too harshly. Because what the Lord has made clean, if he's been washed in the blood, it ain't our business. We don't have the right to judge the Lord's servant. All we can do is try to admonish the brother. Well, brother, try to clean up your conversation because it's not a good example to others that you would want to witness to. You know, that kind of thing. But you also have to give him space for the Lord to change that in him. It might be something he wrestles with till the day he dies. We don't have the right to judge him because of that. So he he took it he took it gracefully because I didn't I don't think he wanted to receive it right then, you know. Um, but he went to church that Sunday of that week, and guess what his preacher preached on? <laughs> the same thing that I shared with him that the Holy Spirit had shown me. And he came back uh, that next day and he said at work, he said, you know, you was right on point. That is exactly what my preacher preached on. I said, well, it was just the Holy Spirit confirming what you needed to hear and understand so that you not only won't do it when you're dealing with this brother, but anybody else. Because it's very easy for us to get a little religious turn our nose up into the air and when we do if it rains we're in danger of drowning because we got it so high in the air no no that's not the right attitude and that's not the right spirit to have if we go back and we re- recollect and I got saved as a child so all my stumbling bumbling I did I was saved when I did most of mine <laughs> I was saved when I did most of mine but a lot of people when they get saved they're adults and so they, they they can even have um, a more clear recollection about, you know, their conversion experience and, and what things they cast away immediately. You know, I was a child. I wasn't doing a whole lot. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? There was things I, did, I couldn't even experience because I was a child. But that being said, that doesn't mean I didn't have my days to get tested. I certainly did. And there were days I passed. And they were days I failed miserably. Thank God for Jesus. So that's a play on words, by the way. Jesus is God. (laughs) But the Bible says he prepared himself a body. (laughs) Praise the Lord. But let me say this. I'm building, I'm building, all of this is just introduction to witchcraft and how it can get a hold of people. Yes. Saints of God, yes, that operate in witchcraft, okay? Because if I had a one-word synonym for witchcraft, it would be control. And as we see the B system, I don't say that that it's emerging. We were born into it. But it's like the, the, the velvet glove is coming off the iron fist. You know, we see we're starting to see its unveiling, but it was always there. It was just underneath the surface. And excuse me. Pardon me, beloved. As we see its unveiling, people are getting disturbed. I'm like, believers, saints of God, why are you getting disturbed? It was always there. Your spiritual discernment is letting you know you need to be involved in spiritual battle against this demonic junk. The darkness is not really rising. It's just being unveiled. Because remember, the Bible says there is nothing hidden that will not be made known. It's it's very interesting to me, and I don't think it's a coinky dink. That's my little word for coincidence. I don't really believe in coincidences. Uh, I believe in divine appointments. And what we are witnessing has been divinely appointed by God. Because the very word occult 
means hidden. So you see, friends, when the when the Bible says there's nothing hidden that will not be made known, it, it's essentially telling us the occult was going to be made known. <laughs> oh, they say the Bible is is old news. No, honey, it reads like headline news if you're paying attention. If you have a discerning spirit. Now, because I came from back in the day involved with a church where some of the church hierarchy, not all of it, engaged in witchcraft and control measures, okay? Let me give you an example. I heard of a lady uh, or a gentleman, I can't remember which right now, say that there was a church that they were aware of where the pastor had a policy that his congregation could not go on vacation without checking with him first and getting his permission. Yeah, I want you to let that sink in for a minute. And I say, oh, not like you're going, oh, hey, Pastor, I just want to let you know I'm going to be gone for a week. I'm going to Canada. Uh, I'll be back in about a week. I mean, that would just be courteous so you don't wonder about you and what's going on. I can understand somebody doing that. But, no, it was a requirement. And before you could put it in at your job to get to get it, you had to come and ask him, could you do it? Y'all, that's satanic. There ain't nothing godly about that. There is no rhyme nor reason for anyone to ever conduct church business in that manner. No way. No way. No shape. No form. No how. That is witchcraft. That is controlling. And I guarantee if somebody would have kept telling me stories about that particular place, I'd have heard worse. Let me give you another example. They will operate in a way that is always about self-aggrandizement for that pastor. I mean, it's borderline pastor worship. They exalt them, okay, in a way that is inordinate. It ain't right. I'm aware the Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. But conversely, if it says to give honor to whom honor is due, do you think there's circumstances where there are people who don't deserve honor? And they're not due honor? Yes. And so we have to be careful. That same honor that's due that pastor is due you, beloved. There. There is no difference between that pastor and you. They're a saint of God if they're born again. you a saint of God if you're born again. In other words, it is is a mutual honor, a mutual respect that is supposed to be there. Not this extolling and esteeming, uh, extolling this person to such a high level That's not of God, y'all. That's not of God. There are pastors that do things like, okay, one example is if they beat the sheep. Jesus ain't never told any of these men that engage in this wickedness to beat his sheep. When we look in the Bible... And Jesus was speaking to Peter, and this was after his resurrection. Peter had denied the Lord, as we know, three times. And Peter, uh, Jesus asked Peter, he says, Peter, lovest thou me? Once he said, yes, Lord, I love you. And I'm not going to go off into the different loves that he was talking about there. Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, not beat my sheep or beat my lambs. Don't know, Pastor. You you better, I want, okay, 
pull up your chair. You you pull up. You turn the volume up. I'm not going to get loud on this one right now. Don't know pastor. No prophet, evangelist, or teacher have the right to beat God's sheep. No, they don't. The Holy Spirit is responsible to convict and to convince. He don't even beat you. How dare they? Yet some of y'all have experienced this. They have, they will humiliate people in church. Y'all, I can't tell you if I walked into a church and I sensed that spirit was going on, I wouldn't get, that pew wouldn't get warm with me in it. That's how fast I'd be going. And in fact, I had that experience not long ago. I went to this particular church. When I walked in, you could smell it when you hit the door. This um, pastor worship. And the way the people were esteeming this this man that was standing up there. And I saw it because I had experienced it in the past. And I was like, oh, oh, heavens no. I let him go ahead and talk. I sat there and got up and got dressed. And so now it was just going to be discerning what was transpiring. I left out of there and never went back because I saw what was going on. It wasn't right. They're abusive to the sheep. They're in your business or the sheep's business in a way that they should not be. It is inordinate. It is improper. It is wrong. Another thing that they'll do is they will take what is told to them in confidence and use it in a manipulative, threatening, and even exposing manner. They'll preach on the sheep from the pulpit, what they heard, what they experienced, or what was told to them in confidence. Some of them will actually call the person out. Others will just say it, and then the person is sitting there being condemned because they know they're talking about them. And it's done to be manipulative. It's a form of of cult practices. Cults do this. It is ungodly and it's not to be tolerated. And I don't say you confront them. No, you run away. There's only going to be a certain person that's anointed and appointed to confront them. If that ain't you, you just fold up your little stuff and leave. If you recognize that these things I'm describing and how they they treat you with disrespect and dishonor, leave. Don't make excuses that church is operating in witchcraft. Another example is that the pastor's personality is larger than life. All right. He's got this big, you know, basically like almost like entertainment status, even if it's only in that church. And it's all about him. Run in the other direction. They will be vindictive. That church hierarchy. There will be vindictiveness. There will be strife. Um, There's going to be all manner of evil when you start looking around. If you're paying attention. And I'm not saying to do that to in any way get involved with it. I'm saying if you open your eyes and you recognize and you see these things, you need to run away. Well, I mean, I've been a member of this church for for 28 years. I I don't care if you've been a member for 50 years. 
It's just going to make it, the longer you've been there, it's going to make it that much harder to walk away. And the devil going to see to that. There are true churches. There are good churches. And you're going to think them a little strange after you've been involved with a, involved with a church that's been involved in witchcraft and control measures and manipulating the the sheep, playing games with the sheep like you're a toy, playing with your life like you're a toy. That's how you know it's satanic. There are certain things that you should consider as a believer deal breakers. Because in relationships, that, that's, there's certain things that just have to be deal breakers. There are going to be things you will not tolerate, you will not allow into your life, no matter who it's coming from. Including pastors and congregations. And if they're not operating in a right spirit, then you need to leave them alone. You don't want to be pulled into that foolishness. Because you will either become someone who is operating in that witchcraft, or you will be victimized by that witchcraft. Hurt, harmed, and damaged by it. I'm trying to think of some of the other um, things that I've seen them do. It's been a number of years since I was involved with that church. I was a child for most of my life there, so I didn't have a lot of say about attending. You know, your parents would be like, you know, you don't want to go because of how you're made to feel being there. And they don't. Like, you know, it's like, you, how do you verbalize that when you're a child? I don't like going. Well, your parents are just going to think you, you're you not wanting to go hear the word. No, it wasn't that. It was all that other mess that was going on. Thank God my parents broke free from it. It nearly destroyed their marriage. It almost destroyed our lives being involved in that church. Now, my father, he was very different compared to the pastor in the church that we were attending. He was the associate pastor there. And he did not engage in these witchcraft practices. And for a brief period of time, the pastor of that church had to take leave and I'm not going to divulge for what reason right now, but he took leave for a couple of months. And during that time, my father was able to manage the church. And when he did, the, the church started to grow exponentially. It had probably nearly tripled, possibly even quadrupled the congregation numbers. The reason was, all he did was teach the word. He did not beat the sheep. He did not get involved in people's personal affairs. He did not advise them in any ungodly ways if they did seek counseling. By getting too involved in their lives, he would just admonish them according to the scripture. And the church grew. See, under this, the head pastor, the church would grow so much, and then he would drive people away with these practices he was involved in. And the church would go, but thank God for those people that were smart enough to leave. Because after he would do something, and it would be egregious to them, he would betray a personal confidence. By preaching on them up there. So then that 
person would be hurt and wounded and not come back? Why would you expect they would? Who would put up with that? But do you know, a lot of people do. They stay there and they allow these people to manipulate them. Oh, believe me, what I'm telling you is mild to some of the things that have been done to people. And if some of you, if y'all can leave comments in the comment section to confirm what I'm saying about different things that you have witnessed known, seen, or had told to you about witchcraft in the church. And some of y'all said, well, these people couldn't be saved. Oh, you want to bet? They were saved. But they had gotten off into some demonic stuff. You can enter into demonic agreement, y'all, and be saved. Have you ever made a bad decision since you've been saved? Go ahead and say yes, because you have. Well, it ain't no different. They've entered into an agreement that was the wrong agreement. And they started doing things they had no business doing. And when the Holy Spirit admonished them to correct it, they ignored it. And then these things become strongholds in people's lives. And that church to this day still operates. And they probably still don't have more than 50 or 100 members because of what they engage in. God ain't going to let that thing grow so they can do that to 100,000 people. There'll be these little weird signals you'll get when you when you go in and you'll start to see things that aren't right. Don't dismiss them. If you see verbal and or, God forbid, physical abuse, that is not a right place to be. Neither one should be tolerated. No one has the right to do that to another human being. No one. So be aware, beloved, um, there are probably some channels on here where they treat their uh, subscribers that way. I hear people insult their subscribers. If I was subscribed, you know how long it took me? from <laughs> About two seconds, if that. YouTube keeps changing their interface from time to time. It might take me a little bit longer to figure something out, but I'll do it as fast as I can, you best believe. Depart. You see, the Bible tells us, and I'm going to give a shout out to Sister Paula V, because she said this a couple of weeks ago on Fellowship Friday, and it's absolutely correct. The scripture says that when we discover there's something wrong with somebody, whether they're a believer, we're supposed to note that person and have no company with them under certain circumstances. People, but she pointed out, people would take note. In other words, they recognize the error, but then they don't do the second part, which is have no company with them. Some of y'all attending these churches and you know the past ain't right. But you love him despite the fact he's doing this wickedness. And I, I can understand that. But you should not be there. You Listen, Jesus said, greater love has no man than to lay down his life, right? For his friend, right? Well, let me tell you what, beloved. You can lay down your life in prayer and don't ever have to dawn that door. Think about it. Put your pastor or that former pastor on your prayer list, him and his family, and pray for him. But you keep it moving. You don't have to allow people to do damage to you 
and to your life, to your psyche, and endure them beating the sheep? Pray for them, and you go find some place that's in the right spirit and in the right frame of mind and are not practicing these little witchcraft uh, mechanisms that they get involved in. I don't care how long you've been a member. Sometimes you just need to let that thing go. Be blessed, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen.